uh, really appreciate this opportunity. I'd like to welcome everybody this evening. I appreciate your time. I realize it's getting a little late at night. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, just like to start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Cameron Clokey. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, uh, trained as such. Uh, did a fellowship in trauma surgery at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, Florida and then a uh, pediatric craniofacial fellowship at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario. Following that, I actually completed a, a PhD in regenerative medicine, specifically looking at the growth of bone next to metal interfaces. Um, for 20 years, I ran the oral and maxillofacial surgery program at the University of Toronto. And during one of my sabbaticals back in the late 90s, I was introduced to a gentleman, Dr. Marshall Urist, which is where my journey with bone morphogenetic protein began. Dr. Urist, uh, for those of you who do not know, is the gentleman who back in the 60s identified that there was some strange component of bone that allowed bone to naturally regenerate, specifically in muscle pouches. Um, and he suggested that there was something unique in bone that caused the auto-induction of bone formation. Uh, after another decade worth of re research, he identified um, the fact that there was something that he referred to as bone morphogenetic protein that he said recapitulated the embryonic induction of bone. And this led to a number of investigators in the bone industry looking for a way to <clears throat> harvest this technology and, and make it clinically useful. As we look at the history of, of regenerative products. I think the first, um, the, oh, well, no, it's not working. Uh, hold on. So the, uh, and, and this is a very old grainy slide because it's an old grainy technology. This is demineralized bone matrix. And back in the, when I finished my training in the eighties, late eighties, early nineties, people started talking about the fact that if you took bone and you demineralized it, it had some activity that could harness some of these bone morphogenetic proteins. Uh, at the time, uh, working with Dr. Urist, uh, I, I was actually working on another protein, transforming growth factor beta one, but I had developed mechanisms for delivery of growth factors. And uh, when approached by a group in Seattle, Washington, I created uh, a technology that's currently referred to as Dynagraft. Uh, where we took my, my carrier technology and added it to the, the powdery uh, demineralized bone matrix to make a putty in a gel format. Um, and we launched this product in 1997. Um, <clears throat> working with Dr. Urist and his lab, we actually came up with the concept of 100% DBM. And in 1999, we launched the Excel product uh, through a company called uh, Gensai. Um, I personally wasn't very happy with its handling. And uh, in 2000, we added some of our carrier to it and we created the Excel product and then subsequently added some uh, mineralized material to create the blast product line. So our lab and our, our group has been in the development of products for a long time. However, uh, and I apologize, I've got dogs barking here. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, in my clinical practice, which was focused primarily on the regenerative bone, re regeneration of bone in the face, I, I, I didn't find these technologies very useful. So my focus and our research, uh, both at the University of Toronto and in my relationship with Dr. Urist was on bone morphogenetic protein. <clears throat> back, back in uh, the early 2000s, we were looking at ways to make bone morphogenic protein less expensive. Uh, being a consultant to both um, the Infuse group and to uh, Stryker Biotech, which was producing a product called OP1, I, I realized that the, the reason for the high cost of bone was actually related to the, um, the manufacture of the protein itself. And so we developed technologies related to the manufacture of the protein to make it more cost effective. And in 2008, we actually established the company Induced Biologics. Um, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but 
from 2008 to 2016. So for eight years, we, we developed a BMP2 product to compete with Infuse. And uh, unfortunately, due to the problems Infuse had, it was difficult to get financing to get through the clinical trials. Um, <clears throat> we became aware that uh, Olympus had withdrawn the product OP1 from the market. And in 2018, we actually, after a, a third company tried to bring it back to the market, uh, we acquired the technology uh, because we felt we had the capability of creating a more cost-effective technology that was actually better than OP1 using the same uh, sort of regulatory pathway. And uh, as the story proceeds, uh, it was in that journey of bringing uh, OP1 back to market that we made a very interesting discovery. And to, to sort of highlight where it comes from, let me just step back to my time with Dr. Urist. So back in 2000, I published this article with Dr. Urist. And in this uh, publication, we talked about the first ever human histological findings uh, from BMP being used in a human. In a human. And it, it, this was a patient that had a, um, a tumor in their jaw. This is, this is my, bari- my area of expertise. We actually had to go in and remove that tumor, and we used a form of BMP that he referred to as BMP-NCP to reconstruct this jaw. Let me just give you an idea of what we did, just as a way of introducing the concept. So what you're looking at on the screen now is the, um, the, the left side of the human jaw. The angle of the mandible is here. The chin is up in this area here. You're looking at the the submandibular region just to blow the neck, and this incision is through the neck. And here we've resected uh, the uh, area where the tumor existed. We've placed, this happens to be a synthes reconstruction plate or a striker reconstruction plate. You can see the size of the the tumor that we removed. This is the tumor's tissue. And what we did is we took the dynagraph material and we added what Dr. Uris refers to as BMPNCP to it. And we then implanted it into the human jaw. And this is the time of implantation. This is uh, six months later. And looking at a three-dimensional reconstruction, uh, we were able to reconstruct a human jaw like it's never been reconstructed before. Not only that, this patient went on to have um, uh, core sections taken when we placed dental implants into this area, and thereby we we were able to achieve the first evidence of uh, histological evidence of bone regeneration using bone morphogenic protein in a human subject. Unfortunately, um, the way Dr. Uris made his BMP-NCP, it wasn't commercially feasible. You would require a number of different donors in order to get a sufficient amount of bone. So um, what we discovered at Induced Biologics was a unique way of harnessing those same non-collagenous proteins and placing them onto an allograft. And we refer to this process as the natural matrix protein process. Now, let's step back for a second and look at bone. So as you know, bone is primarily a mineral, hydroxyapatite. There are water and cells in bone. And the organic component of bone, which comprises about 25% of the bone composition by weight, is primarily type 1 collagen, about 94%. But between 4 to 6% of this organic component of bone are the non-collagenous proteins. Let's take a closer look at these non-collagenous proteins. The non-collagenous proteins are many and varied. Probably the most prominent component of the non-collagenous protein part of bone are the BMPs. BMP7, BMP2, 4, 3, 6, 9, 10. There are about 15 different BMPs within this this cohort, of which two, BMP7 is the most abundant. And secondly, BMP2 is the second most abundant BMP naturally occurring in bone. But there are other growth factors and cytokines such as 
vascular and endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, osteonectin, TGF beta one, bone salad protein, uh, FGF, IL one, PDGF, osteopontin, and these all have some influence on bone healing. And if you fracture a bone, or if you perform an osteotomy on bone, these non-collagenous proteins are released from the bone by osteoclasts, and they start activating the healing of bone. So typically, when you look at a, a, a bone product, let's just say any kind of demineralized bone matrix or osteoamp or any one of the premium demineralized bone matrix products, what you're looking at are, are products where these proteins are, 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 are exposed. The problem is the majority of these proteins are contained within a collagen matrix and only the surface proteins are immediately bioavailable when you implant them into the human body. About 98% of the non-collagenous protein component of bone is still trapped within the collagen matrix of a demineralized bone matrix particle. Now, certain technologies help to improve that percentage, driving it from 98% or about 2% exposure to maybe 4% exposure. But really, the majority, no matter what technology is used, sees that the majority of these, these non-collagenous proteins are trapped within the, within the collagen matrix. The magic of the natural matrix protein process or NMP process is we actually take all of these non-collagenous proteins out and we deposit them on the surface of the bone particle, thereby making your TGF beta one, your BMP seven, VEGF, BMP2, PDGF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, immediately bioavailable when you implant them into the human body. In order to prove this, we took bone from three different bone banks, three different donors from each bone bank. We treated half of the bone using a traditional uh, DBM process and the other half using our NMP process. And the results you see here. As you can see, significantly higher levels of BMP2, BMP7, TGF beta 1, VEGF, and PDGF. We, we tested those five because they're the most dominant growth factors within the non collagenous protein segment. But I think you know, we can extrapolate from this that the entire cohort of proteins within this non collagenous protein uh, sector are contained within that, this shell that now coats the surface of a bone particle. So if you think about how bone heals, the first phase is vascular invasion into the graft site. With that nutrients, stem cells are brought to allow the area to heal. We actually have the vasoactive of growth factors such as VEGF and FGF that enhance this process of revascularization. The second phase is the conversion of the stem cells at that site into bone forming cells, and that's mediated by the bone morphogenetic proteins. And for this, the natural matrix protein process has BMP2, BMP7, like you would find BMP2 in infused, BMP7 in OP1, along with the other BMPs available at normal physiologic levels to help optimize the osteoinduction of bone. And then finally, the last stage of osteoinduction is the deposition of bone matrix, and then the mineralization of that matrix in, in the osteopromotive phase. And we have, again, within these natural uh, matrix protein uh, covering of the bone particle, we have natural cytokines such as TGF beta one, along with growth factors such as PDGF, which are known to upregulate bone formation and ensure optimal bone formation. So in theory, this natural matrix protein process or NMP process will create the ideal type of bone graft almost as good as, as an autogenous bone graft. The only difference is we don't have any 
uh, sur uh, surviving uh, osteoblasts. The other interesting feature of this technology is that we can apply it to normal formats of bone that you would see with allografts, such as the fiber format, the particulate format, and we're about to introduce a, uh, a uh, Kinsella strip, and we're looking at many other formats as well. But we can actually apply this process to um, these different formats. So the second step in this, this evaluation of a technology such as this is to actually see how well it performs. So we've been able to clearly demonstrate the bioavailability of these different growth factors. And let me say that it's a little confusing in the industry today because other groups also suggest that they have these growth factors. And that's very true. Let me just step back for one second here and, um, and review this. So if you look at a traditional you know, DVM or other growth factor, they'll say, well, yes, we have all the, you know, the TGF beta one, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they do. The unfortunate problem is it's trapped within the collagen matrix. The big difference between them and the NMP treated particles is the fact that these growth factors are now immediately bioavailable once they're implanted into the human body. So they're able to be used. Much in the same way is that when you put in an infused graft, you have BMP2 immediately available to be used to grow bone. The big difference here is that we're just not a single growth factor. We have the whole co cohort of naturally occurring growth factors that will allow for the optimization of bone healing and regeneration. So the, the first test that we used for these uh, particles was the in vitro assay using the C2, C12 uh, muscle assay. Essentially with this assay, what you do is you take uh, spindle shaped muscle cells and you apply a material to them. If this material is, has the ability to induce bone formation, it will chase, change the morphology of those spindle-shaped cells into cuboidal-shaped cells, and they start releasing an enzyme, alkaline phosphatase. We then measure the level of alkaline phosphatase, and this has been shown and validated to correlate directly to an ability of a, a material to be osteoinductive. For this particular model, we typically used BMP2 as our gold standard. It typically allows for a release of up to two times the amount of alkaline phosphatase as our standard. And normally in our experience and in the industry's experience, most bone products fall somewhere between 1.5 and one, the, the standard. And in this experiment, our DBM fell exactly where we expected it to, about 1.4 times the standard. What we didn't expect, to be quite honest with you, was a significantly better response with our NMP-treated bone. We expected it to be somewhere around the level of the BMP2, which is the active ingredient in the infused, but in fact, it was significantly higher, 20 to 30% in repeated testing. So then we went to the traditional in vivo animal model, which is the uh, rat muscle pouch. Here, if you take a material that has the ability to produce bone, you put it into a muscle pouch, it will actually uh, create an ossicle of bone in muscle. We use the athymic rats so that we can use human tissue in a rat model. And what, we, what we're showing right here is a uh, cross-section through a micro CT image of the ossicle of bone that was form, performed. In this initial experiment, we compared uh, bone treated using a demineralized bone matrix process versus infuse uh, uh, versus our what we refer to as our Eurist NMP, which is the product that's now commercially available. The results at 28 days showed what we would typically expect with demineralized bone matrix. We see a, a, um, an ossicle of bone that retains its original volume very well. You can see small bits of white here. This reflects new bone formation, typically. Uh, with Infuse, again, a classic um, result. We see the beautiful rimming of bone around a central core um, of, of 
residual collagen, which is the material that delivers the BMP2. However, when we use the Eurist NMP technology, what we see is the similar maintenance of, of size. By the way, these all started off the same size. Uh, we, so we maintain about 80% of the volume we put in. But what you see here is bone growth throughout the entire implant. The beauty of the micro CT image as compared to just using histology is that three dimensionally, we can look at the entire volume of bone that we produced and we can apply certain analyses to it. And in this case, we looked at the quantity of new bone that was regenerated within the ossicle of bone that we found. And what you see here is that there was significantly more bone formed when the NMP treated ossicle was compared with that treated with infuse and, and demineralized bone matrix. And these results were highly significant. We then went, were able to look at the quality of bone. And when we compared the quality of bone, again, the NMP treated bone was a significantly better performer than was that of infuse or DBM with respect to quality. And then finally, the FDA and uh, various regulatory bodies like us to look at histology to make sure that what we're looking at is not just calcified tissue, it's actually bone. And again, what we found uh, looking at this um, at different uh, magnifications, looking at a slightly higher power here, you can see this is the demineralized bone matrix. You see the empty osteocyte lacunae of the demineralized bone matrix particles. You see some nice new bone formations uh, joining two demineralized bone matrix particles. You see this acellular area of fibrous tissue. But if you look at it just at the low power, you can see these long demineralized bone matrix fibers um, that's, that, that are, that are non-vital throughout the section. When you look at infuse, you get, this is a classic infused picture. They show this in their publications as well. Um, you see beautiful bone formation in the egg shelling around the central core, which, which was the collagen sponge. Um, I would suspect if you look more closely, there is some, some osteoblastic activity. In time, this uh, egg shelling of bone will get larger uh, or the central core will be filled in to a certain extent. Um, but the bone quality throughout the bioimplant is, is not what we would want. In contrast, if you look here at the NMP treated bone, you see active bone formation at sort of different stages of uh, development throughout the entire section. If you look at the low power and compare it to the DBM, you see much smaller particles of non-vital bone that are being connected as you see in the, low, in the higher power with new bone formation. Um, and that suggests uh, that the, the NMP process stimulates a more natural bone healing where the osteoclasts are, are resorbing the bone particles a little bit or a lot faster and are stimulating new bone formation a lot more efficiently than with the DBM. And as I said, what's nice is that you can take it and you can apply it to different and familiar types of uh, uh, allograft formats. And here we're looking at our short fiber format and literally we're adding some saline to the short fibers. And uh, within a few minutes, as you will see, they become um, sort of moldable into a putty-like consistency. And in fact, um, in speaking with uh, various surgeons and reps across the country, um, some seem to like the handling of our shorter for, uh, fibers. Um, and I guess it depends on what type of cage, et cetera, they use. Whereas others prefer our long, or long fiber format, which actually provides more of a Play-Doh-like putty consistency as compared to, this is more of a fibrous type of putty. But no matter what, and we, we've tested our fiber, our short fiber, our long fiber, our microparticulate formats, formats, which are the three we now have commercially available. And they consistently form more bone and better bone than what I consider to be the premier product in industry up to this point, which is Infuse. So looking at the innovation uh, pathway 
in bone regeneration. It began in the 90s where we, moved, we were trying to find an answer or a way to work around autogenous bone. You know, in the late 90s, we, we, we figured out that we could make 100% DBM, but in my practice, that really never really made that much of a difference. We've seen other groups try different approaches to growing bone, but really, in my mind, in my practice, it wasn't until 2004 when Infuse got its uh, first approval that we, we really made a major advance. And it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's been, it's been almost 20 years, but really, I think we've, we've, we've taken the rain over from Infuse and the Eurist NMP is really the, is really the future of where we're going. In our company, we will be actually looking at developing a synthetic version based off the, the foundation of, of OP1, uh, so BMP7, and that's, that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, I provide a, a list of references here, um, but uh, this is essentially the, the, uh, the technology that uh, we wanted to share with you tonight. Um, I uh, would like to stop here and entertain any questions anybody might have. Dr. Clokey. Yes. So I have a question. I uh, went through the rat uh, muscle pouch model with a surgeon and he asked uh, why it wasn't used on actual bone. And he even alluded that he thought that that might have made a difference the way infused might have looked on the bone. I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, why a muscle pouch? He even went to say you could have just cut your bicep open and put it there. Why wasn't it? He was asking me why it wasn't actually put on bone, which is, you know, when you're trying to go for the union and effusion, it's you're trying to go bone to bone. Exactly. Okay. So that, that's a really good question. Well, for the past 40 years, the rat muscle pouch has been the gold standard in the evaluation of any material ability to form bone. Um, so let, let's say you've got two bones separated. Uh, really the only thing that's, and you put a bone graft in there, um, you, you then put muscle around the, the, uh, the, the graft site, you, you, need the, you need that graft to actually stimulate bone de novo. You can't rely on the ends of the bone to form, to form bone. And in fact, this is a more robust way of evaluating whether a graft is osteoinductive or not. Uh, the surgeon is correct. I think ultimately uh, we will be doing uh, various studies to demonstrate the ability to form bone in various bony sites, but this is more challenging than growing bone in bone, to be honest with you. Yes, sir. So how would you go back to that surgeon? I mean, what, what would be your thoughts going back just saying, hey, that's the gold standard using the muscle pouch? That's correct. That's the gold standard using muscle pouch. He, he's correct. We, we are not showing a, uh, a bone graft within a bony defect. But if you're putting a bone graft in a bony defect, you, you, you actually already have bone forming there. And um, it, it's, it's not as challenging a defect to use. In terms of infuse, to be honest with you, um, and, and I speak from a, a vast amount of experience because I, I, I was up until recently a massive Infuse user, uh, but I never used Infuse the way um, the company produces it because of exactly the result I'm showing on the screen. The, the, the bone that you get is at the time you want it to be strong is, is actually not as strong because you, you have that collagen that takes like a year or so to resorb away and, 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 and for the bone to grow in. Um, uh, I mean, I, I would be happy to speak to your, that doctor and, and explain in, in greater detail how I think this is, uh, this is a better model to evaluate uh, of, of this type of technology. I mean, the other thing we're trying to do proactively is going out and, and collect clinical data also to support um, the effectiveness of, 
of this technology. And, and in fact, you can go back historically and look at the work that Dr. Uris did with BMP NCP to help support uh, the use of this clinically. Okay, thank you, sir. No, a real pleasure, thank you. I had a question that was submitted here, Doc. Um, what are the histological determining factors of you know, the quality of bone? How, how, do, how is it, uh, what factors you know, determine quality bone when you're comparing the urus versus the infuse? Well, it, it's a good, that's a good question as well. When you, when you look at the histological section, um, uh, as, as someone who spent their whole life looking at histological sections, I could fool you. I could take uh, 10 magnitude, I could turn this to 40, and I could just take a section through this top bit here and say, hey, look, this bone's great. And I could go somewhere in here and find a piece of, say, right in this area here. Hold on a second. I'm trying to get rid of this. I don't know if you guys can see this part, but it's throwing me off. Uh, there we go. No. Oh, not working. Uh, Um, I could show just this part, which is a, an, a non-vital bone particle in the NMP and say, well, the, you know, this bone is greater than that bone. But, but what we do is we actually score an entire section. So we look at this entire sample and say, how much of this is bone and how much of this is soft tissue? And if we were to, to compare this to, to this, for example, there's significantly more bone activity here than there is in this section right here. There is, there is some bone here and it's, it's classic for infused, but in this sample, you see bone throughout the entire section. Thank you. It's, I, I, I'm looking up, does that, whoever asked that question, does that answer the question for you? I think so. That was Alyssa that had submitted that, and I think okay. she okay. submitted it through the chat. She's on, she's on a plane. <laughs> yeah, she did. She had to take off. Can field any other questions? If there's a slide, Dr. Cloakey, that you could put up that shows uh, you have your comparisons of the properties of induced compared to say infuse, osteoamp, community elite, IFAC, yeah. et cetera. <laughs> I've taken that out. Ah. I'll tell you why I've taken it out. <laughs> um, within a week, I'm gonna have data for all of those products. And I think we'll be able to show definitively in, in the form of a more scientific, sorry, more scientific format, similar to this, the difference between the, uh, the different products. I, I, I mean, I think what is important to appreciate is as a company, we've been working at this for 30 years. We, we don't take this lightly. I mean, we had the opportunity to come back to the market with different technologies over the past 30 years. And really since, since we left you know, Dynagraft and that little family of products, we haven't brought anything out. We actually shelved our VMP2 product primarily because of the fact we couldn't get anybody to finance it, but we have, B we have the BMP7 product ready to come back to the market. We actually shelved it because this is actually uh, pretty much where Dr. Uris wanted to go with a bone regenerative product. But, it, you know, for those of us who work in bone and want to see good quality bone regenerate, this is really the solution. And, and so we we took all of our, our resources and, and directed it towards this technology because of its significance, what I believe its significance in the industry. And what's also unique is that, so be, because we were working on a BMP2 product and a BMP7 product, We've, we've, we've been working with the FDA all along. We finished our preclinical program for our BMP2 product uh, and submitted to the FDA. And then when, when BMP7 came back, we talked to them again. So when we figured out what, what this technology was, we actually went to the FDA and we said, 
we, we have this new technology. Here's how we fabricate the product. How do you regulate this product? Will, will this be a PMA, a 510K? And they came back and, and told us that we are, we're actually, um, we, qual we, we qualify as a 361, which is minimally manipulated human tissue from a um, single donor homologous use, which from a regulatory standpoint gives us a much broader application um, than any of the other technologies that are on the market. Uh, sorry, I've got a question here from uh, someone. Uh, so they're asking what the what the process is in treating the NMP process. I'm afraid that is a patented, well, it's under it's patent pending process. So I can't really discuss it. Uh, needless to say, um, we're using American uh, Association of Tissue Banks accredited uh, bone banks throughout the United States to uh, manufacture our technology. And as such, um, uh, it, it follows all the various quality um, protocols that, that exist and have been approved by the US FDA. Would you, when you say that process um, that, you know, the, the NCPs are coated on the outside of the, whatever the carrier is, the fibers or the particulate, is there yeah. any chance of those washing out and having other complications like with HO, like Infuse has been known to do? That's a, that's a very good uh, question. Thank you, Chris. The, so the, the big difference, uh, so with the Infuse product, you have BMP2 at a super physiologic dose that's absorbed onto a collagen sponge. There's not a true bond between the BMP and the collagen sponge. And in fact, it's a porcine collagen sponge. So when you implant this into a human body, um, about 98% of the BMP is absorbed into the surrounding tissues in the first 24 to 48 hours. And, and this, is, this is not new or, or, or novel, this is in their literature. And unfortunately, you don't know what happens to that BMP. And that, that I believe that has led to some of the issues that they have faced. The big difference in all of our BMP technologies, including this one, is we actually physically attach the growth factors to our substrate. In this case, it happens to be human bone. And there is, in fact, an affinity for these growth factors in human bone. Uh, and as a result, they're bound. So when you put them in the human body, they're not released until their activity is required. So you'll see the first release, if you label these, would come from the vasoactive materials, such as your VEGF, whereas the second release will come from the VMPs or the osteoinductions, and the third release of growth factors will come from the osteopromoters, such as TGF-beta-1 and PDGF. No more questions, I see. <laughs> I don't see any more on the chat line. Um, Chris, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously you could go on more about, you know, the, the, benef the, the benefits over the infused product, but I think what's happened maybe in the last five years or so is these other products. That's why I'd asked for a, a competitive comparison. I think that most of us out there in the field are faced with now, you know, competing against, you know, the I factors and the other cell based matrices that, uh, you know, are claiming that have, um, you know, proteins and things like that. So I think any from a, um, a positioning standpoint or any type of sales uh, standpoint, uh, any type of data that we can have directly comparing them uh, to these, you know, besides Infuse would be helpful. And uh, maybe you'd like to share about the other studies that are underway against those. Yeah. Guys. So. So literally for our AOS next week, we should have the data comparing uh, the NMP product, not only to infuse, but also to iFactor, OsteoAmp, OsteoFactor, Trinity Elite, and Vivigen. Uh, and we're going to have similar data with, to which I've shown, you know, that I've used to show the comparison to infuse. 
Um, and I think it's important. I, I know I factor uh, is sort of like the bell of the ball today um, and because they have level one clinical data. Um, back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, I was asked by a company to go and evaluate that technology. And it, it's interesting because P15 or I factor is a 15 amino acid sequence of collagen. And if you listen to them, they say they attract, activate, and accelerate, I think are the three A's that they use. And, and so what they're saying essentially is that they attract these same growth factors that we actually provide. Um, and they're not attracting you know, super physiologic doses, they're attracting, attracting naturally circulating growth factors. Well, in this technology, the NMP technology, we're actually providing those growth factors we're not relying on the body's circulating you know, mechanisms to, to attract, to be attracted to our technology. It's actually there. And each and every lot is um, evaluated for the presence of these growth factors. Um, so, I mean, that's a significant difference. And, and I, I can't tell you what the results are. They're being blinded. They're being performed by a third party. But I suspect that, that we're going to find significant significant differences. Um, OsteoAMP and OsteoFactor use marrow components associated with the DBM product. Again, um, I think we're going to find that they, the, their, their primary material is, is a DBM and their DBM is essentially has trapped, it has all these elements in it, but they're trapped. So it's, it's not wrong for them to say that they, their graph contains these elements because all bone does. But the question is, are these elements bioavailable? And um, and again, we'll, we'll find out the answer. When you when you talk about the cellular um, graphs, there, you know we looked at those a number of years ago, actually, and, and their activity I think comes from the amnion or or associated cellular elements, and not all of them survive the grafting process. So again, I'm, I'm interested myself to see how they're gonna end up comparing to, to the NMP process bone. Uh, I suspect we're gonna find that there, there's not a comparison because really, I mean, the, the only true competitive product to this is Infuse, if you can call it that, um, but that's a 20 year old technology. Um, th this is new technology. This is uh, exciting technology. And for those of you who are involved in bone regeneration, I think once you get a chance to use this, you won't go back. I have a question on, you mentioned the, um, you know, in the, the pouch model, the study as being the gold standard, but what was the reason for picking four weeks uh, versus, you know, further out or what, I guess most times. Yeah. Fair enough. So um, literally, um, you know, when you look at models to evaluate things, you have to look at the history of the model and, and look at what is considered to be the standard. The standard is 28 days. Um, that's what the FDA looks at and other regulatory bodies look at as being an indicator of induction. It, um, you know, if, if we were to look at uh, a longer time period, in our samples, I think you would see, let, let's say we go out to, uh, you know, to two, to two months, we would see a very solid bone particle on our side. If you look at infused, you would see bone growing in, but you'd still see a shell of bone around a central core. And um, I'll, I'll tell you when I've used this type, this technology clinically, and in our practice, you know, in many instances, we're putting dental implants into the bone. So six months later, I'm going back in and I'm putting a dental implant in. If I don't have good bone there, you know, I, I can't get the stability. I, 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 the technology, you know, the dental implant technology won't work. And the only knock I'll tell you against this, this bone is it's, it's, too, it's, it's, if you're not careful, it can be, if you will, too hard. So um, in the jaws, we're not used to some in many instances, the best quality of bone, particularly in the upper upper jaw. And the bone that's formed with this is a very good quality bone. So um, when you're putting the implant in, you have to be careful how you drill it so you don't burn or 
or if you will kill the bone as you put the implant in because then your implant won't be successful. I mean, I say that as a negative, it's really not a negative, it's a, it's a positive, it's good to have good quality bone. But um, uh, I know in the first couple of patients where I had to go back in and put implants in, I was, I was astounded at the, the quality of bone and uh, I, I had to be careful with my preparation. Looking Any other see. questions then from anybody? Um, there's no other questions. I just, a uh, few points I'd like to bring up. Um, number one, that, uh, you know, we, we have the product. We've, um, I guess our first cases that we did at Fuse were in the, the beginning of the fourth quarter last year. Uh, we've had hundreds of cases, the majority being in spine. Um, uh, no, no issues, no complaints, no problems with any of the cases. We do have the short and the long fibers in stock. We have the particulates as well. Uh, we have had some cases in foot and ankle and uh, you know, for other um, uh, fusion type cases that have been utilized outside of spine as well. So um, the only challenges maybe we've had is obviously the cycle that everyone's aware of, of getting into hospital systems or getting on to uh, contract with facilities. Uh, Induce is uh, approaching at the national level and the GOP uh, process as well as um, VA. Um, is it safe to say, Cameron, that uh, that Induce has a VA contract that is nationwide? We have a nationwide VA contract, yes, today. Yeah, so we have like a VAT pack put together. So um, I think, you know, if there's a first steps, if, uh, if you're a distributor out there or have, you know, connection with surgeons and you want them to uh, go through this process. We're going to schedule another one of these in about three weeks, I think, uh, maybe the first week of April, uh, first week or two, and uh, can have another, you know, advertised webinar like this. But uh, Dr. Cameron's always, Dr. Clokey's always been generous with his time, and we've been able to schedule even some one-on-one -on -one, uh, webinar or, you know, Zoom meetings if you have surgeons that want to uh, have a chat with uh, Dr. Clokey, uh, we can arrange that as well. So um, if there's no other questions, I guess, then we can maybe wrap this up. Anything else you want to add, Dr. Clokey? Or? Well, no, I just want to thank everybody for attending. And I, I guess the other thing that's, that just came up as you were talking, you know, with Infuse, there's that immediate post-operative swelling that seems to persist for a period of time. We don't see that with this technology. It does not exist. And I don't know, Chris, is anybody that you've treated in those hundreds of patients, have they experienced that? I no, not at all. There's been no abnormal reactions or anything. And those are questions that came up. If you remember some of the surgeon meetings we had of, you know, in, in type of response or concerns about safety issues, because maybe you can touch on the, the infuse with the, uh, the Chinese hamster ovaries. <laughs> well, the, the, the BMP2 that's fabricated uh, for the infused product comes from Chinese hamster ovarian cells. And there are some residual host proteins that exist within the human BMP2 protein as a result. And that can stimulate an inflammatory response along with the super physiologic dose um, that is used. And both of those attribute to both of those factors attribute to that 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 early swelling that you see. But um, you know we we've had surgeons using it in the cervical spine, and, and they have not seen that classic inflammation that you see with the uh, the infused product. And that's a good point to make as well. I mean, we have the copy of the FDA letter, and if and if you're involved with uh, say amniotic fluids or injectables over the last year, then you know. How, uh, how FDA seems to be tightening up on policies of, you know, what is a drug and needs to go the BLA pathway versus an actual allograph. So that's part of our VAT package is we have a copy of that letter from the FDA stating that it's clearly a 361C allograph. And um, as Dr. Cook, you mentioned, so we meet that criteria and that's important to point out, I think that there's no contraindications, unlike Infuse, which is, you know, basically 
that's lumbar fusion is off label. So here we have the ability to use in cervical, as you stated, as well as in the gutters. There are uh, strips that are coming, uh, supposed to have those out about mid-year this year. So, um, and then that opens up to any other specialty in foot and ankle or, you know, ortho in general or anything else. So it's very exciting and uh, we've been doing well with this product and we're just looking forward to a great year with it. Uh, we will be at WAOS um, next week, gosh, next week. And uh, so any of you are gonna be making the trip, please stop our booth, love to speak about it. And, um, look and I'll be there as well if, if anybody wants to talk further. Absolutely. Oh, and likewise, if, if you or your surgeons were, you know, coming, we'd be happy to uh, set up a meeting or anything with Dr. Cloak. He will be there for the whole week. So, um, so anyway, we'll have a recording of this. Um, and I think uh, uh, we have circulated the deck as well. But again, if you, if you have uh, other contacts or surgeons or, you know, even the hospital uh, materials people, anyone that would like to have this presentation one-on-one, uh, -on -one, we can either share the recording or we can certainly uh, set up any of those individual meetings. So if, I guess if there's no other Great. questions, then I, again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, special thanks, Dr. Clokey, for the time tonight. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, look forward to great things and a great year. Yes. Take care. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you.